Good seeing you guys, and I, I'm excited to have an open conversation. It's probably, I don't know which number of pizza ranch we've been to, but it might be hundreds, hundreds. <laughs> joking around with some of the people outside. I love the pizza at the pizza ranches, but this campaign trail has really gotten into my exercise schedule, interfered with that, so now switch to the salad bar at the pizza ranches, but, but, uh, but we've enjoyed this. By the end of this, we will have done... I think about 390 events is the count that we will have done by the time of the Iowa caucus. And that's my favorite part of this process, is actually meeting fellow citizens who care about this country and love this nation and what we stand for. Not the media, I mean a lot of the distortions in this process have been eye-opening. One of the things that's been eye-opening is the influence of money in politics. I mean, you know it's going to be bad, but not until you see it firsthand with your own eyes. Every politician anymore is dancing to the tune of the biggest donor. It's like the sun rising in the east, it sets in the west. Every politician is dancing to the tune of their donors. And in my case, that biggest donor is me. I don't report to them. I report to you, the people of this country. This is a job interview to be hired for who actually leads this country. So that job interview shouldn't be with a bunch of super PAC puppet masters. It should be with the citizens of this country. And that's why Iowa goes first, and that's why we're proud to be here. My parents came to this country 40 years ago with no money in search of opportunity. And in a single generation, I have gone on to found multiple successful companies. Did it while marrying my wife, Aporva, who is a throat surgeon. She's going to be in the next event. She couldn't make it to this one. She's with our two sons. She's bringing one of them there. She's a throat surgeon, one of the best at what she does, yet is here pursuing this campaign with us because this is about saving the life of this country. And I sat down with the poor of about a year ago and shared with her and our family that I felt it was our sense of duty to step up and do what we're doing now because we saw that red wave that never came. You guys remember that? <coughs> a little over a year ago? Why? They blame Donald Trump to abortion. Let's get to the root cause of why. It's because our Republican Party, we have grown lazy, actually. And I don't mean lazy in the get up the vote operation sense of lazy. I mean lazy in a deeper sense of defining who we are and what we even stand for. What does it mean to be a Republican in the year 2024? What does it mean to be an American in the year 2024? We have lost a good answer to that question. And to me, it means we believe in the ideals of 1776, actually. Ideals like meritocracy and the pursuit of excellence. That you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. That's why I've said we will end affirmative action and racial group quota systems in every area of American life. It's been a cancer on our national soul, and we're done with it. It means we believe in the rule of law. And I say this as the kid of legal immigrants to this country. That means your first act of entering this country cannot break the law. And that's why I've said I will use our military to secure our southern border and our northern border too. That's what it means to stand for the rule of law in the United States of America. It means that we, the people, create a government that is accountable to us, not the other way around. That the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government. Not the shadow government in the deep state that's actually running the show today. So you know what? On day one, we're going to start 75% mass firings in the number of federal bureaucrats, which we will end by, by, by the end of my first term. That is how you drain the swamp. Shut down these government agencies. The FBI, the ATF, the CDC, the U.S. Department of Education, we're not just going to massage them around the edges anymore. We're going to get in there and actually shut them down. And that's how you revive the integrity of our republic. Don't start with last year's budget as the baseline, which is in turn based on the prior year's budget, which is based on the year's budget before that, all of which are corrupt. And that's how you get the $34 trillion national debt. Anybody wonder how we got here? Start with zero as the baseline. 
and ask for what's actually necessary. It's called zero-based budget. That's how I've run my businesses. That's how many CEOs across this country run their businesses. That's how I'm going to run the federal government of the United States, and that's how we tackle our national debt problem. If I can't work for you for more than eight years as your next president, which I think is a good thing, then neither should any of those federal bureaucrats who are reporting into me either. Eight-year term limits for the bureaucracy instead of civil service protections. That is how you drain the swamp. This shouldn't be controversial. This is common sense. What does it mean to be American? It means we don't depend on an adversary for our modern way of life. That's why I said as your next president, I will actually declare economic independence from communist China for everything from our pharmaceuticals to our semiconductors to our military equipment. Today we depend on China for it. By the time I'm done with my first term, we won't. That's the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson would have signed if he were alive. That's the Declaration of Independence I'll sign as your next president. Now to get there, we do need elections that we can trust and believe in in this country. You're not supposed to talk about this one. But it may be the most important thing in the long run. What I'll do as your next president is ensure minimal federal standards for federal elections. Single day voting on election day as a national holiday with paper ballots, government-issued voter ID to match the voter file, and yes, English as the sole language that appears on a ballot. These are not black ideas or white ideas. These aren't even really Democrat ideas or Republican ideas. These are American ideals that we fought a revolution to secure in this country. And I believe deep in my heart that those ideals still exist. I'm running for president to revive them. E pluribus unum. It's on the back of our coins. It means from many one. That's what we've lost in this country. We have been taught, our generation has been taught to celebrate our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all of the ways that we are really the same as Americans, bound by that common set of ideals. And here's how we're going to get them back. It's going to be by all of us. Not just me. All of us. Starting to speak the truth in the open. Say in public what you will say in private at the dinner table. Say it with a spine. Say it with conviction. Say it with respect. But part of respect is that you respect your neighbor enough to tell him what you actually think. And you see, that's what this campaign is about. Speaking the truth, not just when it's easy, but when it's hard. Speaking the truth, not just to the Democrats on the other side but to our own side in this Republican Party right here at home. There's a reason why I'm the only candidate in this race who can even tell you certain things. That I will strip the vaccine manufacturers of the special liability exemptions that have been written into the law. There can be no without that. To tell you that the CO2 pipeline that they're building across much of this state is unconstitutional and using eminent domain to seize the land of innocent farmers, which is wrong, and then I'll end it. That it's based on a climate change agenda that absolutely is a hoax because it has nothing to do with the climate. To tell you that Ronna McDaniel, the failed chairwoman of the RNC, needs to step down after five failed years of leadership because we need accountability in our own party before we can bring it to D.C. To tell you that I will pardon every peaceful January 6th protester on my first day in office because that's the right thing to do. But ask yourself why I'm the only candidate who can tell you these things. That's what I told you in the beginning. Every politician is bought and paid for. This is going to take somebody from the outside. Somebody from the next generation with fresh legs to reach and lead the new generation of Americans. That is why I'm in this race. It is out of our sense of duty to this country. 
I'm an America first conservative, but it's going to take somebody who knows what America is, who knows our Constitution, to swear an oath to it. It's going to take an outsider, and I bring that. You guys have got a decision to make in about nine days, so let's just have some real talk that goes to the heart of that. There's two America first candidates in this race. That's Donald Trump and myself. He's an outsider, so am I, and it's going to take an outsider. But it's also going to take an outsider who knows and deeply understands the law and the Constitution in this country. And they duped him. They told him you couldn't fire those government bureaucrats because of civil service protections. Read the law. Those civil service protections do not apply to mass firings. And mass firings are absolutely what I am bringing to the D.C. bureaucracy. They told him you couldn't end birthright citizenship for the kids of illegals. I will on my first day in office, because that's what the 14th Amendment already says. We don't need a new constitutional amendment to do it. They told him you couldn't deport all of those illegals in this country because there's only 6,000 ICE agents. Well, if you read the law, you actually can use local law enforcement to serve those warrants. Now you have a million people who can actually do it. But it takes a president with the spine to actually order it. So I believe I'm going to be in this race to take our America First agenda to the next level. I respect Donald Trump and his legacy, and I've done it more than any other candidate in this race because it's the right thing to do. He was a good president. But the America First agenda, it does not belong to one man, not to me, not to Trump. It belongs to you, to us, to we the people of this country. And it pains me to say this, but it also pains me to see something playing out with such clarity to watch us walk into a trap. If you think they're going to let this man get anywhere near the White House again, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. They're selling us the rope today that they will use to hang us tomorrow. These people, they will stop at nothing. They've made it clear now. Literally nothing. To keep this man away from the White House. Everything you saw was just, you know, you see the first court case, then the civil case, then the prosecution at the state level, or the federal prosecutions, then forget the judicial system. Just take him off the ballot directly. And I've called on every other Republican to say, let's remove ourselves from those ballots, too. I've done everything in my power to stop this, but this system has made clear they will not let this man get anywhere near the White House, and we cannot fall into that trap. We love the man because he got this fight started, but now it is our job and our duty to finish it. We owe it to our founding fathers to make sure America First does not end with Trump. It didn't start in 2016. It started in 1776. And we owe it to our country to make sure we have another 250 years and then some left to go. You got the future of America first standing right here. It's my duty to this country to make sure that we don't fall into that trap this year. And so I'm asking you to join me in doing the right thing for our country, even if it's a little different than what you might have thought three or four months ago. And if you all do your part on January 15th, and that's what I'm asking you for, and to share with 10 people in this community who couldn't be in this room today, everything I just told you, and bring them on January 15th too. If you all do your part, I promise you, Apoorva and I and our family, we will do ours to make sure, not in some fake politician way, but in a true way to Make sure that our country's best days are actually still ahead of us. Thank you for coming today, guys. God bless you and your families, and may God bless our United States. Can I practice what we preach a little bit? I'm going to sit across the table from Xi Jinping in about 18 months, and so I promise you I can handle the hard questions. Give me the hard ones. You have an important decision to make. We'll start with you, and then we'll go around the room. Right. Look at her. Listen to you last night. Make sure you're happy. Uh, I was able to ask you at the end, but it was quick. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Um, mental health. Yeah. I know you were in very, you know, in that trend. What, if anything, as 
So right now, we have a healthcare system that doesn't pay for mental health. Let's start with that. A lot of the health insurance industry doesn't pay for a lot of health. We have a sick care system, not a health care system. Part of that is because of the health insurance lobbying. There's special antitrust exemptions for health insurance companies that allow them to coordinate with each other. That not only increases premiums, but it reduces the scope of what they cover. They try to carve out things, dental, vision, mental health care is out of the scope of it. But we'll pay for sickness on the back end. So the number one thing I'm going to do is reform that health care system to pay for mental health care. A lot of this needs to be preventative, not just dealing with sickness when it actually occurs. A lot of this involves actually even starting at a young age, listening, the signs. And this relates back to what many teachers will tell you. It's the ugly truth. Kids are sending signs much earlier on that they're in need of help. We don't give it to them until they actually are outright sick on the back end. Empathy and openness on the front end makes a big difference. Bring back mental health care and a health care system that will pay for basic psychiatric and psychological support when necessary, long before you have the, God forbid, the situations like you have in Perry, but even the need for antipsychotics and everything else that you otherwise see. That's number one. Number two is we have to bring back the psychiatric institutions of this country. We shuttered them 40 years ago. And over the same period we've seen the closure of those psychiatric institutions, we see a spike in violent crime. That's not a coincidence. These things go together. And so the answer is, have the courage to actually bring back those institutions. Avoid the abuses of the past, fine. But those abuses were exaggerated by pharmaceutical industry lobbying. Because they wanted to close those institutions to be able to sell more of their atypical antipsychotics. So I think that's a big problem, is the lobbying in this country as well. So th those are two key steps we can take. And then one I'm going to be specific for is in our veterans. We have a VA system that does not take care of our veterans. We have a country that doesn't take care of our veterans. Basic changes we can make. We have about 40 veterans a day committing suicide in this country. That's unacceptable in the United States of America. Basic steps we can take. If you're coming back from a combat role, six-week paid decompression buffers in a third-party location. Shouldn't be a partisan idea. Many veterans aren't reporting their PTSD because they're afraid of being tagged with the red flag law. They should get privacy restrictions to be able to report their PTSD. They shouldn't have to drive 150 miles to the nearest VA center. They should be able to get community-based medical care where they are, and I'm gonna reform the VA to make sure of it. For veterans, maybe a little spicy for the Republican Party, but it's the right thing, and so I'm gonna say it, because I stand for it. Schedule one substances should be descheduled for medical therapy for veterans with PTSD to be able to go <laughs> through the VA. Otherwise, you have veterans turning to fentanyl and suicide and worse. And then I personally think that many veterans who come back, we should also just send them the signal that we care about you. Veterans benefits and active duty military compensation should not be subject to federal taxation, period. So as it relates to veterans and the mental health epidemic, that's a separate area that I can directly address as your president. But other than that, we're also going to reframe the laws and the lobby that allows for a more competitive health insurance marketplace and also one that then covers mental health care in a way that isn't really happening today. Great question. Thank you. I appreciate it. Someone over here have a question? Right there, and then we'll come to that. A couple of you. Okay. Uh, when you're elected, uh, with, with the positions you're taking, you're not gonna get a lot of cooperation in Washington to start with. How do you address that? Yeah, so, I, built, I believe in learning from some of the lessons of my predecessor, Donald Trump. You strike the swamp, the swamp strikes back, no doubt about it. You gotta move quickly is number one. 75% mass firing across the board. Really torch the bureaucracy, unsparingly. And day one, we're, we're weighing the ways to do this within the bounds of the law as the US president. One way to do it, I'm not saying it's gonna be exactly like this, it's gonna be something like this. If your social security number ends in an odd number, you're out. If it's an even number, you're in. It's day one, on day two, the federal government will be half its size. The sun will still rise in the east and set in the west. Not a thing is going to break. And in fact, it turns out you have to do it that way. Because otherwise, they tell presidents they're going to be sued into oblivion for a political retaliation lawsuits or civil rights lawsuits. But large, indiscriminate mass firings are not covered by those civil service rules. So this is where they dupe Donald Trump, as I alluded to earlier, that they're not going to dupe me. And I'm guided by my understanding of the Constitution. I have something that Trump didn't, and I give him credit for it. That's the current Supreme Court. 
The current Supreme Court everything agrees with everything I'm telling you, six to three. So will we get sued? Yes, we will. But we'll take that to the Supreme Court and we will win. Now the next president who comes after me won't have his hands tied in the same way. The other mistake that many presidents make is they start with their legislative agenda going through Congress, yet they get frustrated by going through Congress because that's designed by our founding fathers to move slowly. Right now the real reforms we need are in the executive branch of government, in our military, in the use of our military at our own southern border, in the fixing of our Department of Homeland Security that has delivered failed border policies in our own country, the enforcement of the rule of law, the ending of birthright citizenship, the ability to actually rescind most of those regulations that are hampering our economy so we can drill, frack, burn coal, embrace nuclear energy, firing the federal bureaucrats, shutting down the FBI, the ATF, the CDC, the U.S. Department of Education, giving that $8 billion back to parents across this country who deserve to choose where they send their kids to school. These are things I get to do as your president. And I think that that's something that it reflects how bad the current situation is. The people who we elect to run the government in Congress, the people who you normally work with, they're not even the ones really writing most of the rules anyway. It's coming from the administrative state. But the good news on the flip side of that is that is something the president can fix. But it takes a president who both comes with sharp elbows from the outside, and I bring that, and admittedly Trump brought some of that too, but also a president who knows and deeply understands the law and the Constitution. And those two things don't usually go together. Right? You'll have the academic law type over here, you have the business <coughs> guy you can execute over here. Those two things don't usually go together. I'll say a word about this. It's important to me. You know, it's my faith that, in fact, leads me to this journey. It gives us our sense of duty. The heart of my faith is that, and, and for those of you who don't know, I'm Hindu, which is different than the traditional faith background that people have run for U.S. president. I mean, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. John Adams actually had a Hindu drift late in his post White House life. But, but it's the same value set, which is that there's one true God. He puts us here for a purpose. And it's our moral duty to achieve that purpose. God works through us in different ways. We're still equal because we're equal in the eyes of God. But for me, I believe God has given each of us our own unique God-given gifts. And I'm going to use mine to do what's right in this short time we're given. And that's what pulls me into this race. It gives us our sense of duty. And I think when we're guided by that sense of purpose belief that it's being done not by us, but through us. Somehow some government bureaucrat doesn't seem quite as scary anymore. So we're going to face that down and be guided by the oath to the Constitution that I take. And we're going to keep that oath and be guided by it. Not just by personal emotion, but by a purpose enshrined in our Constitution. Man's Use word that. That's how man's we get this word. Done. Yes, thank you. Bring that thank back. You that. I appreciate it. Did you have a question earlier? I do. Yes, thank um, you. I'm wondering where you stand on ethanol and trade. We, we farm. And I also recently read today that you're a vegetarian. Is that yeah. correct? This is like the third time I've gotten this question today. <laughs> yeah, and I literally was at another pizza ranch right before here. I got the same question, so that's good. So, well, I, don't, I don't know where they... Yeah, I am vegetarian. That's true. Yep. Is that working for you in Iowa? Yeah, things work just fine for me in Iowa, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Got that salad bar, the pizza ring. <laughs> pizza too. I'm so, vegan. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's where the big muscles come from. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, so, my view is, and the beauty of this country is, so it's actually, I was part of the faith background I was raised in as a Hindu. My parents brought us up in a vegetarian household. And we stayed that way through our adulthood. But I'm not running for pastor. I'm running for president. And I swear an oath to the Constitution and keep it. The First Amendment comes first in the Bill of Rights. It says two things. You're free to worship freely, practice your religion. You're free to speak freely. But if you swear an oath to the Constitution, that means everybody else is also free to live out their purpose in this country without government interference as well. So for farmers, again, a lot of the regulations coming from those three-letter agencies, that's really what's, I think, impeding the work of a lot of farmers in this country. The complex WOTUS regulations, I don't think have been very good. A lot of the EPA regulations, I don't think have been particularly helpful. I don't know if this affects you, but the carbon capture pipeline making its way across the northern and western part of the state violates the private property rights of farmers, which absolutely is 
the baseline threat that any landowner and any farmer actually faces is a threat to your private property. If they can build a pipeline across your backyard in the name of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to fight climate change, and that's a basis for eminent domain to build a pipeline on your land, the next thing they do is take your cow, right? Because they leave a $50 check in your mailbox, they set the price when it's eminent domain. And so I'm a president who's actually going to stand for every kind of business owner and entrepreneur, including farmers in this country, by standing for the Constitution and against the kinds of regulations that impede you from doing what you're going to do. But if, and I think about connecting the dots between the question, I have to read that article that they got out there. But if the question is, oh, am I vegetarian? Is that going to affect sort of my beliefs for animal farmers or farmers or otherwise who are raising livestock? The answer to that is no. It's not my, it's not my choice to be able to say, just because I just sort of make certain choices, that I'm going to impose that on anybody else, just as nobody else's choices are going to be imposed on me. We have freedom in this country, and we need a president who understands that. That's the oath that I take, is that it's to the Constitution. So I hope that addresses your question on that point. On the ethanol point, just to, just to leave that. Okay, they're going to drag me out of here soon. On the ethanol point, so I believe that energy security is national security. And so the more energy production we have in the United States, the better. The reason I favor the renewable fuel standard, the RFS, which you're probably familiar with, is actually a market-based justification. What I mean by that is if we had true consumer choice at the pump, we wouldn't need the RFS. But we don't have consumer choice at the pump because of oil industry lobbying. So then you look at the places where we do have consumer choice at the pump, like in Wichita. People actually choose a higher blend of ethanol in their fuel than the minimum set by the renewable fuel standard. But they can't do that elsewhere. That's why we have the renewable fuel standard as a second best alternative. So that's actually, I believe, a more principled justification for the renewable fuel standard, not because you're a politician that comes every four years to Iowa and briefly says, oh, I love farmers and check that box before not doing anything about it. This is a market-based justification, and that's why on principle I stand for it. So I hope that addresses both of your questions. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sir. Two questions, and one's very quick. <clears throat> Given, I, I don't call D.C. the sewer, swamp anymore. I call it the sewer because there's noble life in the swamp. Yeah. Will you commit to not picking a sewer rat as your vice president? Yes, actually. Thank you. And not only not as my vice president, but not as my nas not national security advisor, not as my secretary of state, not as my head of the FBI, not as ambassador to the UN. First of all, I don't think we should be funding the UN. <laughs> what about the point. FBI? We should yeah, fund sir. any institution hostile to the WHO, to the UN. We should not be using our taxpayer money to fund institutions that are hostile to our own sovereignty. I'm sorry, that ends on my watch. And I think this is a big difference right now. I mean, look, I can't speak for, I think there's two America First candidates in this race. It's Donald Trump and myself. And I think those are the two acceptable choices, minimally acceptable choices for this country. But I'm gonna be taking our agenda to the next level because one of the ways that you frustrate your own agenda is if you hire people who are hostile to your own agenda. So the John Boltons and the Nikki Haley's of the world, they're going to be coming nowhere near my administration. And I believe in learning from the past. But I think I'm the only person, apparently, in this race who could say that none of those people is going to be coming anywhere near my administration this time around either. You're going to ask me point blank, is Nikki Haley or John Bolton or anybody else going to be my vice president? My answer is absolutely not. It's going to be an America First patriot who shares our commitment to shut down and cut through that federal bureaucracy. What does America First mean? It means two things. The people we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who run the government. And they owe a duty, their sole moral duty, to the citizens of this nation, not another one. 40,000 troops sitting in places like Germany. Why? They don't even spend 2% of their own GDP on military expenditures, which is the NATO minimum requirement. We're the fools sitting here accepting that. I'm going to move our troops to protect not somebody else's border halfway around the world, don't send $200 billion of our taxpayer money to Ukraine so some kleptocrat can buy a bigger house. That's what's going on today. And most of the Republican Party actually supports it. They're in on the grift. I'm going to use our own military to protect our own borders in this country. Our national defense spending should, should go towards defending our own homeland, not the sewer rats that are actually sucking the lifeblood out of our system. I like that expression. I'm going to be taking that with me. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. It does. Question number two. We've only been a debt-free country once, and it was done illegally under Andrew Jackson. How do yeah. you solve it? So I think some small amount of national debt's acceptable. Problem is, our national debt's out of control. 
right? If the interest payments on our national debt become the largest line item in our federal budget, then we're toast, right? Then you're in quicksand. And we're about five years from that happening. If that happens, we don't have a country left. That's what gives me my sense of urgency. We don't have the luxury of time. People ask me, oh, if you don't win this time, will you run in 2028? I mean, that works for me. I don't have to run at all. Our family, thankfully, this country has blessed us with a life that my parents wouldn't have imagined when they came to this country that I wouldn't have imagined when I was growing up in Evendale, Ohio, when my dad was facing down layoffs at the GE plant. This country has done enough for us, but for this country, I don't think we have that kind of time. So how do we fight our national debt? It's going to take somebody who understands exactly how to do it without cutting Social Security, which is what the rest of the Republican Party wants to do. Fork over more money to Ukraine while cutting Social Security here. That's what I call America last. Cut veterans' benefits while you're at it. They'll say, no, not on my watch. Here's how we fix it. Get the oil and natural gas out from underneath our ground. Sell it. Use that to buy down about $8 trillion of our national debt. Avoid the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan or the future versions. Those two wars added $7 trillion to our national debt. The Taliban is still in charge 20 years later, for God's sake. And Iraq is a more broken country than when we showed up. Don't make those same mistakes. And then, yes, fire 75% of the federal bureaucracy. I will start that on my day one in office. Our national debt's then under control. And we've done it even without touching Social Security or Medicare. By the way, most people ask the question, how do you avoid cuts in Social Security? I'll ask a different question. This has a businessman here. What if I told you there was a way to increase Social Security benefits? Many people collecting Social Security can't even make their ends meet because the value has been inflated away relative to what they paid in. What if I told you I can increase Social Security benefits without adding a dime to our national debt? Here's how. Forty years ago, if the amount in the Social Security surplus had been invested in just a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds and treasuries, just like your financial advisor would tell you to, Today, the average person collecting $1,800 per month in Social Security benefits would be collecting close to $18,000 per person per month. Think about that in your mailbox. It's government malpractice of the highest order. Well, we can change it for the future. We won't touch Social Security or Medicare benefits for the people who are already getting them, and for the next generation, by the time they are collecting it, it will be that $18,000 number without adding a dime to our national debt. So I think it's time we have a CEO in the White House who can't be duped. That's what it's going to take to revive this country. But look, I think if we don't get this right right now, I think the flip side of that is we're in a national debt quicksand, and I don't think we're going to have a country left. And I think that's the choice we face. You have a book for me? Would you be willing to sign it after you're done here? Which book is it? Yeah, of course. The Constitution so. and other founding American documents? It would be my honor to. Thank you. Honor to. Thank you. Well, I think they're giving me the, the we're going to Blackhawk uh, County, we're, we're doing a final event in Waterloo, so if you guys would like to join us there, we're just going to have, a, have some fun there tonight. But let me say this in, in closing. I understand what we're facing down, and I'm not just saying this to be a fake optimist. I'm not a fake optimist. I'm not going to be that guy who comes in here and tells you that it's morning in America, because it's not. But I believe it can be, actually. I think that's what Ronald Reagan would say if he were alive in this room. He wouldn't tell you it's morning in America now. But it can be. We don't have to be this nation in decline anymore. We don't have to be at the end of the ancient Roman Empire. I think what George Washington would say if he were here is that as a nation right now, we're really just a little young, actually. Going through our own version of adolescence. Figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. So when you view it that way, it makes sense. You go through your adolescence, you do some stupid things. You go through that identity crisis, you lose your way. But we are stronger for it when we get to our adulthood on the other side. So no, I don't think we have to be this nation in decline. 
I think it just might take somebody whose best days in life are still yet ahead. And I don't take that for granted. But I pray that they are. Somebody whose best days in life are still yet ahead. To see a country whose best days are still ahead of itself. <clears throat> so if you all do your part, that's what I'm asking you for. This system isn't made for a guy like me to do this. 38-year-old outsider coming in to actually literally break the system and gut the bureaucracy. No, I'm sorry, the system isn't made for it. But they don't get to decide. You do. That's why it works this way. This is why Iowa goes first. And if I win the Iowa caucus, I am your next president. If I'm your next president, we get done what I tell you we're going to get done. And I can tell you now, based on what we see, I think we're going to win the Iowa caucus. Many of our supporters are first time ever caucus goers. All I need is your help to get there. And this community is helping. So if you all do your part on January 15th, and that's what I'm asking you for. I promise you, my family and I, we will do ours to make sure that we can tell our kids that you get ahead in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, your own dedication, and that you know what? You are free to speak your minds at every step of the way. That is the American dream. That is what we are running to. And with your help, that is what we are going to revive to save this great country. Thank you for coming, guys. God bless you.